yeah, as Nikki said, uh, this presentation is really going to dive into how to capture and track the many different types of outputs, some you might have anticipated, some maybe less so, um, that you will end up producing as part of running a network or a large scale project. Um, so it's really important that you can um, capture and track all of your outputs properly, um, especially so that people can access them, um, but also so that you can demonstrate what you've actually achieved in your network or project. Um, so there's no point in just like noting these down on a little bit of paper or I guess the modern equivalent having a messy Excel file that only one person actually understands. Um, so ideally, you want to have all of your outputs firstly stored somewhere accessible. And as um, Gavin mentioned about having their DOIs um, such that they can be found by any interested party and are easy to sort of pull and collate together. Um, so when we say outputs, obviously the first thing that a lot of people think about is journal papers or perhaps just like journal papers and conference papers. Um, but as like, discuss like discussed in the research presentation, there are so many more things that can be considered as an output and many of these um, deserve a DOI themselves. Um, so you've got some other outputs such as videos and presentations. Key thing that will be reports that you put out from your project um, or on your events. Um, you can also do interviews, um, posters, code and data sets. Um, so these are quite a few um, different things. And obviously there are also some of those other areas that are potentially a little bit more um, or less tangible. Um, but these are all parts that you produce um, and you should deposit them ideally in your institutional repository with easy ways to refer to them. So how should you track your outputs? Um, so Personally, we advise putting everything tangible into your institutional repository, first and foremost, so aka all the things you mentioned on the previous slide, so your videos, presentations, reports, interviews, posters, code, data, whatever you've produced, think about putting it into your institutional repository. Um, and in addition to this, you can also link and store these outputs to different types of accounts in different places outside of the institutional repository uh, to provide more information and to allow people to engage with them and for them to be available by type in different locations. Um, so obviously there's tracking it in Research Fish, which we're not going to go into because Gavin's just delivered a beautiful uh, presentation on that. But there's also quite a lot of other types of ways that you can make this information, uh, you know, that's obviously for the funding body, but this is so you can make your information publicly available to everybody else that wants to engage with your outputs as well. Um, so I'm just going to talk through some of these different options. <clears throat> so firstly, let's cover storing the outputs in your institutional repositories um, and ensuring that they have a DOI because that's really important. So I would say wherever else you store your work, it should always go into the institutional repository as well if it's linked to your project or your network or even just personally for you. I store all of our or mine and Nikki's many double act journal papers in there as well. Um, and this is because it future proofs the outputs of your project and network um, because obviously you can store them on websites or other things as well but um, you know there's always the risk that, that gets taken down or ceases to be maintained once the funding is run out um, and it provides one location for a comprehensive set of all of your outputs together um, so you can typically request DOIs via your institutional repository um, so the, the team that manage that will then go and give you DOIs and make sure that those are then requested um, and that then means all of your outputs can be individually citable in their own right um, and then you could actually go and reference them in your publications if you want. Um, so the screenshots on this slide come from our institutional repository that University of Southampton uses uh, which is Pure. So this is an example for a report that we produced for one of our conferences uh, which was one of the many different outputs for this event. Um, so as you can see it has a DOI um, so it could be cited and referred to. Uh, it also has the uploaded copy of the report. Um, obviously, as a nod, if you are doing this for things like journal papers or things that might have not an open access policy, you can't necessarily always whack stuff in there. Sometimes you can and you can embargo it. Um, but if it's your report and you're making it open, which we were in this case, absolutely fine to upload. Um, you can put in some general details and metadata for anyone who wants to know what it's about. Um, obviously, I've added all the authors. We've got all the publishing details. Um, and as you can see on sort of the middle screenshot, you've got the series defined. So I'm going to talk a bit later about um, organising series with your reports, but this is the um, AI3SD event series, and we put its numbered place in that series as well. Um, and it also has an event type, so you can make, uh, I don't know if all the institutional repositories don't like this, but if anyone using Pure 
pure, you can make events and then you can link all of the outputs through to that. So there's just lots of nice little neat ways of cross-referencing things within Peer as well. Um, some of which will show up on the front end, but some of which are just also for you as well. Um, and for Give Measure, we have actually gone and linked all of the related outputs. Um, so then if we look in this, we can actually see everything that happened pertaining to that event, be it a video or a report, et cetera. Um, and finally, as you can see on the bottom right, very important, we have linked our funding information, which in this instance does mean it will automatically pull into Research Fish with Network when it uh, comes time to complete that. <clears throat> so another way to track your outputs, particularly if you're ensuring all of them have a DOI and can therefore be searched and cited via the web, is to create a Google Scholar profile for your project or network, um, which you can do using as you know, generic email address for that project or you don't want to do it on your personal one because that would need to be your personal Google Scholar account. Um, so all of our network related outputs get linked to our AI 3SD Google Scholar account. Um, and then we can track them as a collective, even if we haven't specifically created them, because whilst Nikki and I create quite a lot of the outputs for it, we also fund other people who go away and create projects or as people create posters, we bring in other people to write our reports. Um, and this just means that actually everything that's then network associated can come in under one bracket as the network or as a project rather than it being due to an individual person. Um, and this also means you can uh, keep track of your citations and your outputs as well, which is really useful. So as much as I said, don't just rely on a website, having things on your website is also really, really useful um, because having it in your institutional repository is great for DOIs and paying everything in one place and all the cross-referencing but your website can really provide an attractive way of presenting all of your outputs. So as you can see, hopefully you'll agree with me, the table on the, the slide, um, which is a screenshot from one of our website pages, looks a lot more aesthetically pleasing and easy to comprehend than maybe interacting with the pure front end. And there you can see all the kind of different outputs that we had associated with our summer seminar series. Um, there's also YouTube. So if you are creating videos, then you can create yourselves a YouTube account. Um, this allows you to create playlists of related videos and also just to track how many people engage with your videos and want to subscribe to your content. So that gives you a really good idea of how many people are actually coming and watching all the things you bother to put up. Um, there's quite a few things you can do to make this YouTube channel more appealing um, and to make it easier for people to find and engage with. Um, so if you're able to get to 100 subscribers, um, which you could do by just pleading with all of your friends to subscribe to it, then you can have your own vanity URL um, and you can use YouTube video descriptions to cross reference content to your website. Um, personally, we add all of our funding information into the YouTube video descriptions. So we have information about the person giving the talk, the projects that are funded it, and also we link back to our website because it's always nice to have all those different cross references so people can follow through your content. Um, you can also then link together related videos in a slightly different way. So typically on our website, we tend to put things together by series, um, but you can set it up on YouTube so you can have little end cards to suggest, oh, if you've watched this, you might want to watch this. And then if you've actually had videos on similar content across different series, then that's a way to link those together, which is quite nice. Um, you can also have things like captions to improve accessibility, which might not be as easily offered if um, you're just putting them up on your repository for people to download. Um, but it is worth remembering with a nod of caution that YouTube isn't available in all countries. Um, so you wouldn't ever want to just store them on YouTube. You would want to have local copies and you would want to make sure they're also stored in your institutional repositories as well. Um, and in a lot of places you can actually cross reference and put the YouTube link. So again, everything just nicely links up. If you're producing code or indeed data sets as part of your project or your network, then it is also advisable to store these somewhere using uh, version control software such as GitHub. Um, so as best practice, the code you're developing would use Git to ensure that it's properly version controlled and stored. And then you could always make the final version available via your institutional repository. Um, however, with Git, you have the capacity to add a lot more information such as readme files, you can have issues and pull requests. Um, you can also invite a lot of different people along to collaborate with you. And generally, you know, looking at a GitHub repository, you can get a lot more information about the overall lifecycle of a coding project or a data set than you could if you just downloaded the final copy. Um, from a repository. I'm not going to go too into the Git world here because um, we did actually create a big video on this. So if you're interested in finding out more about GitHub, I've put a link on the slide um, and you can watch our colleague Sam Monday talk about how to set up Git and get organized with that. Um, so 
obviously, um, as we've highlighted before and in the research fish thing, it's also really important to um, track the other types of engagement and outputs that you um, do. So um, when we discussed the institutional repositories, we talked about everything that is tangible going into there. And But there are a lot of other things that we want to track that potentially aren't as tangible, um, but are really important to keep a track of um, nonetheless. Um, so this might be if you have a meeting or an event that leads to a new job opportunity or a collaboration that might result out of that um, and potentially leads to new funding, um, then you want to be able to capture um, those kind of outputs as well. Um, and these are often the things that might go into the um, log in research fish. So in those categories, uh, some of the blue categories um, that Gavin showed on his slide, um, those are kind of the things that are slightly less tangible. Um, so um, you might also be able, want to be doing this into like one of your sort of final reports or demonstrating your impact to your funding bodies. Um, so one way that we utilize um, to track this in a way that makes it a little bit simpler is to set up an email account or maybe an email rule on an existing account um, so that each time you either have one of these engagement activities or an output, you can send a note about it to that email address. Um, and then it's there. So when you come to filling in research fish or generating a report, writing a new proposal, anything like that, you have a handy list um, of all of these activities and outputs that might otherwise be overlooked in your record keeping. And as we have mentioned throughout, and Gavin has also mentioned, link everything with the grant code. Um, so not only does this show that the project uh, show the project that each output is associated with um, and also the source of the funding in terms of where it's come from uh, but obviously it helps with that automated linking and population uh, so for example when we put this in youtube and uh, put into our institutional repository we'll be linking it with the correct um, grant code and then it will be linked into our systems and pulled into our research fish record um, so this is really good, really useful. Um, and we also um, ask everybody, so when we've done any funded projects or any sub-project reports, um, also make sure that they're always using the grant code, um, so just so that everybody that's working on your project is always capturing um, that link through that same grant code. Um, uh, final thing we wanted to touch on. Uh, yep, in a bit more detail is creating output series, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so if you can cast your mind back to the peer record, um, so we had that logged under an event series, uh, but you can make series of whatever you want. Um, so in our case, we have project series, interview series, we have internship series, um, you can have whatever you want. Um, obviously, I recommend calling them after what the actual thing is, um, probably not like a bacon series, unless you were doing something about bacon, in which case that could be very relevant. Um, but it is just sensible to collate together all these uh, same types of outputs, so you know, videos, interviews, or things that are related, like all your different types of events or funded projects, um, just so you can make sure these are all consistently managed and numbered. They're a really helpful tool in creating the document part of these output series and also ensuring that you capture all the correct information um, is to create document templates. So the examples on the slide are lists of what we include in our event report and funding report series. Um, and a similar structure would work for sub projects, work package reports as well. Um, and having these templates just ensures consistency. And it also just gives anyone writing them a good starting point to understand what they should be putting in. Um, so we work together with our wonderful head of research data and IP at our university, Isabel Stark, to agree on what should be covered in these templates. Um, so, you know, all of these are public on our site, so feel free to follow our structure, but also um, we're sure that somebody from your own research data management team would be happy to help as well, and um, so it's always worth reaching out to them. Um, so there we have it. Uh, so that's a quick dip into uh, tracking all of your outputs. Um, so it's really important to track them all. Um, both by your institutional repository um, for completeness um, and also to link things for research fish. Um, but it was also really useful to have them available through um, different um, methods for um, availability, um, but also tracking some of the things that don't go in the institutional repository allows you to fully demonstrate um, sort of the breadth of all of the outputs that you have done. Um, and it allows you to really demonstrate your impact um, at a later date. Um, so yep, hopefully this was useful. Um, so again, uh, we'd just like to acknowledge the people that have um, helped across the build it to nailed it, skills scientists, 
uh, network of networks um, projects uh, in helping us to create a lot of material that forms the basis of the presentation. 